welcome to another program in our series, As For Me, I Choose. I want to believe that the Lord has been blessing you all through the series as you and I have been taking a walk through scripture, seeing God's wonderful plans for our lives, seeing God's wonderful promises for our souls, experiencing the joy of being in a relationship with God that will bring peace, that will bring joy, that will bring blessings forevermore. As we conclude our series, our message is, As for me, I am the chosen. And it's taken from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we'll be reading from verses 6 to 8. Deuteronomy 7, from verses 6 to 8. For you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor chose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. As for me, I am the chosen. I'd like you to bow your heads as we seek the face of the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your amazing grace, for your wonderful love. We realize that we cannot fully comprehend or understand this, but we ask that day by day you help us look up to the cross of Calvary so that by beholding, we can become transformed, so that by beholding, we can begin to more clearer and better grasp the length and the breadth, the height and the depth, the magnitude of your wonderful love towards us. And as we grasp it, dear Lord, may this love transform our lives. May it draw us closer unto you. We're back once again to listen to your word. And Father, our prayer is that you would bless your word upon our hearts, that it will bear fruit that will please and glorify your name. We ask that you be with your servant as he speaks, that the words of my lips shall bring glory and honor and praise to your name, that our gathering together shall be also to your pleasure. To this end we pray that you will speak and we shall be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, a contemporary gospel musician named Lauren Daigle came up with a song that became so powerful and so popular, a song that many could identify with in so many ways. The title of a song which won her awards on the contemporary gospel music platform, Dove Award, was entitled, You Say. And the chorus goes this way. You say I am loved when I can feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I am weak. And you say I'm held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, you say I am yours. And I believe, yes, I believe, I believe that I am the chosen one thing that the Bible teaches clearly is about the special relationship that God had with the Israelites. A special relationship which Moses tried to make them understand the purpose for which they were loved by God. In the passage we took our scripture reading, God made the Israelites understand that the promised land was going to be their inheritance, their possession. Not because they were the smartest of all the peoples. Not because they were the greatest, not because they were the strongest, not because they were the best. Indeed, he says, you were the least. And despite your position, despite your status, despite who you really were, God chose you because he loved you. Because he loved you. And the love of God, Jeremiah tells us, 
in chapter 31 is an everlasting love. One that knows no limit, that has no boundaries. That can only be described as from east to the west. Infinity. That's the love that God has for his children. And everyone he calls, he calls for a purpose. Oh, there's this passage that you and I love so much in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. But preceding that passage is the verse that Paul writes to the church to help us know our status. Remember Romans ch chapter 8? That's a passage that begins with, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Hallelujah. And that is the status that Jesus wants you and I to have. No longer under the dominion of the law of sin and death. But now we are under the control, the direction of the law of spirit and life which is found in Christ Jesus. No longer condemned. But now accepted. No longer under a sentence. But now set free. No longer guilty but purchased with a price, a price more precious than silver or gold. That's who we are, redeemed, restored, freed. That passage begins with no, no condemnation and ends with no separation, but in between, God wants his children to understand that special relationship he has. There's a lot in that passage, but that's another sermon. But Brother Paul says in that section, he says, For those who God called, he predestined. For those who God predestined, he predestined for salvation. We're called. We're predestined. We're special in his eyes. We're his elect. Amen. Amen. God's special treasure. Did you hear it in the passage we read? Deuteronomy chapter 7. It says there in verse 6, God called you. The Lord our God has chosen you to a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples. A special treasure. The word in Hebrew, segula, means the most prized possession a person can ever have. That's who we are in God's sight. When God looks down from heaven, he doesn't notice the buildings. He doesn't notice all that man has constructed. All he's looking for are those who are his own. They are his special treasure. Special treasure. What you will die for. <laughs> kind of reminds me of a story. Many years ago, I heard how some thieves, desperate thieves, broke through a house, used some cement, uh, used some uh, acid mixture, poured it on the cement, were able to make a hole through it. And they got into this house and they robbed this woman. And when folks heard her crying later, guess what she was more concerned about? The thieves had gone off with a lot of wealth but for her, the most important, the most prized possession that they went away with, you guessed it, her jewelry. Her jewelry was most important to her. That's the one that hit her the most. Well, people may prize their jewelry. Some may treasure their cars. Others, it may be their mansions. Others, it may be their paintings. But for God, his precious treasure, his most prized possession is you and me. We are the chosen. We are God's chosen. Precious in his sight. No wonder Paul could say right into the church in Ephesians, you know who you really are? Do you know who you really are? You are God's workmanship. You're God's masterpiece. Amen. Somebody says, you know what you should do? You know what you should really do? You should take a selfie of yourself. And when you take the selfie, make it bold. Enlarge it. Frame it. Put it on the wall. And there put the prize. Made by God. Hallelujah. That's who we are. Made by the Most High. A few years ago, 
a few years ago, a painting by Michelangelo sold for 450.3 million US dollars. Let me take that again slowly so that you hear me. I didn't say 4 million. I didn't say 45 million. I said 450.3 million US dollars. A painting by Michelangelo, bought by Saudi prince. A painting called the Salvatore Mundi, Jesus, the savior of the world. In that painting, you find Jesus holding an orb in his hand, in his left hand, and he has his hand raised up in blessing. A painting that costs 450 million US dollars. And why did the painting cost so much? Why was it so valued, so treasured? It's believed that this was the last painting by this great painter, Michelangelo. A man was multi-talented, a painter, an artist, an architect, a sculptor. So the last work from this great man cost so much. And so, what do you think a painting of me should cost? Mm -hmm. If I was made by God, then how much am I worth? More than silver or gold. More than diamonds or rupees or rubies. More than anything man can measure. Because I am the chosen. Yes, my brothers and sisters. That's who we are in God's sight. Unfortunately, because of sin, because of our brokenness, because of our lives on this earth, battered and bruised, broken by circumstances, by situation, by sin. Whenever we look at the mirror, what we see is what isn't pleasing to us. We see what offends our hearts. We see what brings pain to our souls. We see what makes us wince or feel bad. But what God sees is value. What God sees is worth. What God sees is through the lenses of his love. What God sees is Christ covering you and I. Chosen. Precious. We are his. Not just because we are his creation. But because of the price he paid for our redemption. We become adopted into the family of God. <laughs> I remember a story I read many years ago of a young boy who had been adopted by his parents somewhere in the West, in America. And he was going to begin public school very shortly. And his parents were worried, knowing how children tease each other and how hurtful it could become. And so the parents tried to explain to this young boy just about six years old. And you see, we want you to know something about you. And then they began to explain that you are ours through a different way. Some children are born and other children are adopted. So some children are brought into this world even though they're not loved. But you, we chose you. Because we loved you. We adopted you. Because you're precious to us. And so, imagine how this young boy felt when he went to school the next day. Next to him was a young girl on the bench right next to his. And so, he couldn't wait to tell the good news to his classmates. And so, he hit her a little with the elbow and said, Are you born or are you adopted? And the little girl said, well, I don't know. When I go home, I'm going to ask my mom whether I was born or adopted. And so the little girl got back home and asked, mommy, 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 am I born or was I adopted? And the mom said, who told you that? 
You were just born. And so the little girl went back to school the next day, met her new friend in school. I said, no, I wasn't adopted. I was only born. Because the little boy had told what adoption means. That you are adopted because you're loved. You're not just born by parents who you are bothered to. But you are loved. You are chosen. Amen. That's how we are in the sight of God. While you and I may see imperfections, inadequacies, inconsistencies, what God sees through his lenses of love is precious, is worthy, is what makes us chosen. Chosen. His greatest treasure on earth, which is why he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to die on the cross. For us, because we have value in his sight, we're precious unto him. Because you see, my brothers and sisters, the value you have for an object is what determines its worth. And so often, when we get things that we don't deserve, we don't know their value. Did you hear the story about the young boy? A young boy whose father had a problem and went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I don't understand this, my son. Father was a millionaire. Bought his son a brand new car. Within the next few months, the car was a wreck. The father took it back, bought another one and gave it to him. It didn't take too long again. He had another accident. And the father said, listen, I don't understand. These cars are expensive. And the pastor said, you know what the problem is? It's because he doesn't understand or value or appreciate the car. So, don't replace it for him. Let him get a job. Young man got a job. Began to earn his money. And after a short time, he was able to save enough to buy a 25-year-old car. And this young man bought this car. And when he bought this car, he loved the car. He washed the car regularly. And would wax it so that it could shine and the father couldn't understand. I bought him a brand new car. He wrecked it. He bought a car that is 25 years old and so cheap. And he loves it. And the, father, and the pastor said it's because he, he knows what he spends on that car. What is your value? What is my value? The value we have in the sight of heaven is the price that Jesus paid on the cross. More precious than silver or gold. More valued than ruby or diamonds or platinum or whatever measure. That's what God has made you and I to become. Adopted. Adopted. In 2 Samuel, we learn the story. Of David. David, after all the travails and the trials, David finally becomes king of Israel. Saul had done everything, everything within his power in order to keep David from becoming the king. Indeed, he sought several times to end the life of David, but God preserved him. God protected him. Finally, David becomes king. But David remembers. He remembered the covenant he had made with Jonathan, the son of Saul. Jonathan and himself had made an oath that whatever the future would be, they'll be kind unto the others. Family. So 2 Samuel chapter 9 tells a story, a unique story, of how David, now on the throne, asked the question, chapter 9 verse 1, now David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And one of the servants of Jonathan was called and he said, yeah, there is. And he said, is there not someone still of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to him, verse 3, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame. In his feet. The story 
is of a man called Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was a young boy when Saul, his grandfather, had gone out into battle. Mephibosheth and his nurse were there when the news came that Saul and his army had been killed. And the tradition in those days was the moment the king was dead, any contender to the throne would make sure he eliminated any relative of that king who was dead so that the pathway to becoming the new king could be assured. And so when the nurse taking care of Mephibosheth heard this, she picked up the little boy and began to run. Unfortunately, she fell, and in falling, the leg of this young boy broke. And from that point in time, Mephibosheth became lame in his leg. Not knowing what the situation would be, not knowing the heart of King David, believing that David, like all the people, would be vengeful, since Saul had done everything within his power to wipe out David, they felt that the safest thing to do was to disappear completely. And so when David asked, where is he? Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Maki, the son of Amiel, in low Deba. Bible scholars struggle to be able to tell us the precise location of this town called low Deba, but all we know is that it was in the middle of nowhere. This man had faded into obscurity. This man, Mephibosheth, who had royal blood in himself, had now become a non-entity, hiding in the shadows, fearing for his life. And imagine his surprise when finally he heard that the king was looking for him. Brothers and sisters, every time you read scripture, I would like you to put yourself in the place of one of the characters in that passage, ask yourself how this speaks to you. Imagine that you are Mephibosheth. For over three decades, you've been hiding in obscurity. You've been satisfied in no one knowing your true identity. And then all of a sudden, you got a word that the king wants you immediately. Imagine Mephibosheth being brought before the presence of King David. King David, who had run from pillar to post, from cave to forest, until the only place he could even find safety from the hand of Saul was when he went to serve as a soldier in the Philistine army, serving under Achish. So imagine what he thought would be his end, his reward. And that is when David says unto him, verse 7, do not fear, for I will show you, surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Hallelujah. A man who expects the sentence of death. A man who believes that he and his family are under a generational curse. Mm -hmm. And now he's standing before the king expecting a death sentence. Condemnation for the sins of his father. Rejection because of the past he had had. Death and destruction because of the deeds of his grandfather. Yet what he hears is not a sentence of death, but an announcement of grace. An announcement of grace. The word loving kindness of God, the tender messes described that way in the King James Version, actually comes from a rich Hebrew word, kesed, a word that is difficult in interpreting, a word that means love, kindness, mercy, goodness, grace, a word that is rich, a word that is full, a word that is all-encompassing, that is God's attitude towards you and I. Grace, undeserved favor. Grace, 
unmerited goodness, grace. Grace because we're chosen. Grace because we are adopted. Grace because of his mercy. Yes, my friends, amazing grace. How sweet the sound has saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, now I'm found. Was blind, but now I can see. Yes, my friends, it's only grace that can do that for us. No wonder John could say, Brother John, remember John, one of the closest disciples of Jesus, one who had that anger management problem we talked about, one who wanted to call down fire and thunder from heaven to destroy a Samaritan village. Now, as that grace of God has worked upon his heart, all he can talk about is the love of God. And as he writes his epistles, he writes about this love. Chapter 1, love. Second epistle, love. Third epistle, love. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished. Like one version of the scripture puts it. Has bestowed. Has poured out upon us. And you and I should become sons and daughters of the Most High God. That's who we are. That's who we are, God's chosen. Because of grace. Grace that sees value. Even when you and I see rubbish. Grace that sees worth. Even when you and I see pain. Grace that sees all of this treasure. Even when you and I can only see dust. Grace, because God loves us as if we're the only ones. Because, ha because God has a destiny for us, a place of greatness. Every time I preach for my Daniel seminars or use the book of Daniel for my evangelistic campaigns, I want to close with Daniel chapter 12 and share God's plans for his children. A wonderful passage in Daniel 12 that tells us about what will happen in, our, in the last days. And who knows how close we are to the last days. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel tells us that a time of trouble such as the world has never seen is coming. A time of trouble that will also be a time of deliverance. Daniel chapter 12 says, at that time Michael shall stand up. That great prince who stands up over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Amen. Everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the doors of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Did you hear that? A time of crisis is coming. But while folks are focused on the crisis, the saints of God are focused on Christ. A time of trouble is coming, but the time of trouble is also the time of great deliverance for God's people. Yes, a time is coming, a time when some shall arise from the grave unto condemnation. But those whose names are found in the book of life shall arise and shine like the stars in the firmament forever and ever. I'm talking about you and I. That's God's destiny for you and I. That's God's plan for you and I. That's God's program. That's why he sent Christ to come into this world. To lead us to the better way. To show us the better path. To bring us back to relationship with our Father. That's why Jesus came. I love to share the quotation from Ellen White where she says, it is God's plan. 
to unite the family on earth, to repopulate heaven, to repopulate heaven with the place that the angels that fell in rebellion fell away from. God's plan is to repopulate heaven so that you and I will take over the, take over the space that the devil and his angels left. Amen. In that great controversy between good and evil, between right and wrong, between light and darkness, between God and Satan, the wrath of the enemy is because you and I are appointed to take over the places. And that's why he does everything to deceive us, to delude us, to derail us, to destroy us. Because you and I are appointed for a destiny in the skies. That God wants to repopulate heaven with you and I. We're chosen. Chosen. Called out of this world. To become separate from sin. To have a character fit for eternity. To be able to shine with his glory. That's the purpose that God has for us. That's the plan that God has for us. That's the program. So what are you passing through now? Passing through pain? Tribulation? Trials? Intense temptations? Passing through hardship? Deprivation? Destitution? Discouragement? Disillusionment? Passing through want or nakedness or farming? or sword, passing through fire, or flood, or water, or what? God is with you. His grace will be sufficient for you. His plan shall be accomplished in your life. Because yeah, he's chosen. You're set apart. You're his most treasured possession. When the Paul could say, you know who you really are? When you look in the mirror, what, do you know what you, you, who you really are? What do you see? Paul says we're ambassadors of Christ. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter the money in my pockets. It doesn't matter whether my shoes are worn out. My shirt collar is frayed. It doesn't matter whether my, sh my, my, my trousers are too short or my coat is not the right size. It doesn't matter whether I slap, uh, I mean I walk. I have no car to drive. It doesn't matter how they look at me. It's how God regards me. That is important. Uh, I, know, I know we're rounding down. Sisters, I want you to be careful how you choose those young men. Don't turn away a young man just because his shoes are already swearing up to God or have a little hole in them. Be careful how you turn away that young man who has uh, 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 frayed collars uh, because his shirt is wearing out. Be careful how you turn away that young man who, because he, has, he can take you out for a date. Be careful. Because that young man may be your joy tomorrow. Maybe your hope tomorrow. Maybe your salvation tomorrow. Because he has the quality of God in him. He has greatness in him. He has a treasure in earthen vessel. He has a connection with his father. So he may look poor today. But he's a prince. He may be knocked down today. But he will rise up tomorrow. He may look like nothing today. But tomorrow you have everything. He may look like zero today, but tomorrow he'll be a hero. Be a hero tomorrow. Be a hero tomorrow. And to watch out for appearances. We talked about that a few days ago. Uh, I wanted to tell you back then, young man, I hope you're not choosing the girl you marry on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Because on Sabbath we all look like saints going to heaven, right? All dressed up and looking nice and prim and proper. But it's only for the trick. But God wants it to be different. That even though the vessel, the vessel is clay, let the treasure, the treasure be within, be precious. But we do the reverse. We want to dress up the outside, but the inside is corrupt. The inside is rubbish. And we spray perfume all around to mask the fact that we stink. 
but God wants to do it the other way around, from the inside out, wants to transform us. That's what Paul was talking about. Be not conformed to the world because there's a pressure from outside that wants to make you, mold you, shape you in the image of the world. There's a pressure from, from without. But God wants to work from within, shaping us on the outside, beginning with the Spirit in our innermost parts. One pressure wants to make us conform. The other pressure from within wants to make us transformed so that we resemble our Father. We resemble the one who died for us. We resemble the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. My brothers and sisters, I want you to pause and ponder the wonderful love for God, of God for us. A love that is the theme of songs throughout the ages. A love that cannot be described or explained. A love that must be experienced by all. A love knows no boundaries, has no limits, knows no end. A love that is stronger than death. That's the love the Father has for us. And it's the power of that love, our understanding of that love, that will transform our lives, that will change our ways, that will stop us in our tracks, that will make us know our true worth. Because my brothers and sisters, in this life, you may say, I can't figure my ways, but God says, I will direct your steps. You may be saying, I'm too tired, but God is saying, I will give you rest. You may be saying, it is impossible for me to change, but God is saying, with me, all things are possible. You may be saying, I can't forgive myself, but God is saying, I forgive you. You may be saying, I'm not worth it, but God is saying, you worth it. I sent my son to die on Calvary for you. You may be saying, I'm not smart enough. But God is saying, I will give you wisdom. You may be saying, I can go on. But God is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. You may be saying, I can do it. But God is saying, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You may be saying, I can manage but God is saying, I will supply all your needs richly and abundantly to my son, your savior, Jesus Christ. You may be saying, I'm afraid. God is saying, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of boldness, of sound mind, of a self-control. You may be saying, I feel all alone. And Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. This is the love of our Father for us. This is the love that died for us. This is the love that is wooing us back to God. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I ask you, don't let go of this God. Don't let go of this love. This love, this love that the Bible cannot describe. This love that makes Jesus so precious in our sight. Oh yes, my brothers and sisters, as you follow him, as you choose his way, as, uh, as you choose to hold fast unto him, as you choose to make him your God, as you choose to let all for his sake, then you will discover how God is all sufficient. He is from A to Z to you. You'll be from your A to Z. That's what it means when the Bible says there's the Alpha and the Omega. It's from the first letter to the last letter of the Hebrew Bible. He says he is our Alpha and Omega. He'll be your bright and morning star. He'll be your cornerstone, your counselor, the captain of your salvation. He'll be your day star, the desire of all nations. He'll be your ever-living one, the El Shaddai, the Elohim. He'll be the the firstborn of the dead. He'll be the good shepherd. He'll be Emmanuel, God with us. He'll be Jesus, our joy giver. He'll be the king of kings. He'll be our kinsman, redeemer. He'll be the lily of the valley. Jesus will be that living stone. Jesus will be our Messiah and our maker. He'll be our overcomer. He'll be our provider, our protector, the pilot of our salvation. Jesus will be our redeemer, our restorer. He'll be our savior. Jesus will be our way maker. Jesus 
will be Yahweh to us. Jesus will be the zeal of all of us. Jesus will be our all in all. I don't know about you. I don't know what name you know him by. But I've come to know him as that God who is the dream maker and the promise keeper. The one whose ways are past finding out. The one who died so that you and I do not need to die again, but have a place with him in his kingdom. That's who Jesus is. I urge you to yield your life unto him. I plead with you to discover the power of his love. I beseech you to let go of everything and hold fast to him and him alone. Jesus loves you so much. He's made you. He's chosen. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we are the chosen. We are the elect. But the election is not for nothing. The election is for a purpose. The election is for a purpose. You and I are chosen for a purpose. Why are we chosen? We're chosen because God loves us. But we're chosen because God has a plan for us. Chosen because of his love. Chosen because of his grace. Chosen because he wants to be with us for all eternity. But not only are we chosen for a purpose, we're chosen for mission. One of the other days we shared the message that the reason why God has called us out of the darkness of the world where we once lived, into the fold of his marvelous lights, out of our lostness into a new way of life, out of our brokenness into healing, is so that you and I can declare the praises, announce, publicize, proclaim, magnify the praise of the one who called us out of darkness into his light. When we were once enemies, he made us his friends. That's the purpose. That's the mission. But also we are chosen. Chosen not only for a purpose, not only for a mission, but we are also chosen so that you and I will become just like him. Amen. Chosen to belong. That's why Jesus came. So that he can bring together the family of God on earth a family that resembles their father, so that when they look at us, they can say, these are truly sons and daughters of the Most High. Remember when our firstborn was born and folks came and saw him? One of the comments, I don't forget, is one of, a, one of the comments of one of our family friends who said, Pastor, just relax. If this, your boy gets missing in a supermarket, a market or wherever it is, don't worry. They'll bring him back home because this guy resembles you totally. Yeah, the pride of every father is to hear that the son or the child or the daughter looks just like the father. A photocopy, they say. And that's how it was with the saints in the city called Antioch. It was there they were first called Christians. But when they called them Christians, it wasn't necessarily a, a name of commendation. It was rather a derogatory name that they were like small Christ, baby Christ, miniature Christs. That we resemble our Father totally. We're chosen to belong, chosen to become like Him. Let's round up the service. I ask you, my friends, I beseech you, my brothers, I want you to determine what direction you go. I want you to choose this day. Choose this day. What pathway you'll walk. Moses, standing before the nation, chart them. Similarly, Joshua stood before God's people and chart them. Considering the grace of God upon your life, considering the mercy that God has shown unto you, considering all of God's love and the faithfulness of his promises, therefore choose this day whom you will serve. As for me, I choose life. As for me, I choose courage. 
As for me, I choose to rise up again. As for me, I choose to stand on holy ground. As for me, I choose faith. As for me, I choose contentment. As for me, I choose to wait on the Lord. As for me, I choose the God of war. As for me, I choose to follow holy. As for me, I choose the unfailing God. As for me, I choose to serve. As for me today, I choose God. I choose to follow him. As for me, I choose to hold fast. And as for me, realize I'm the chosen. As I close, I remember a story I listened to. A story that has been written in a book. A story of the rescue of a lady called Jessica Buchanan. Jessica Buchanan had served as a volunteer to people in Somalia. Around 2010, she got there because of the love she had to serve refugees. She served in this organization that was taking care of children who were refugees, children who had lost their parents in the war that was going on in Somalia. Well, one day, while she and others in her group, in her NGO, were ministering to the children, guess what happened? A band of Somali warlords came to that place where they were, surrounded the place, and took them captive, carried them away hostage. Jessica, she told the story, and you can Google this on the CBS uh, report. She tells the story how she began to fear for her life. She was afraid that they would rape her, that they would kill her, and she would never see her husband or her parents any longer. All these thoughts were flashing through Jessica's mind. But the Somali warlords had another plan altogether. They got their cell phones, they got their contacts, and they called and they began to ask for ransom. They didn't plan to kill them, but they planned to use them as hostages to make money from them. In her own case, they asked for $45 million when they learned that she was an American. And she knew that nobody would pay that money for her. $45 million? Who would pay? And even when they tried to call her office in Nairobi, where they had a headquarters, the people realized what was happening and they blocked all contacts. And so they began to wait and hope that somebody would negotiate with them so that they would have money for this young lady. Days turned into weeks. She and the other captives were given barely enough food to exist for a day. No taking of a bath. No care whatsoever of them. But what the what this uh, uh, kidnappers did was they took videos and they would try to have negotiation with the people in America. But the American government has a no negotiation stance when it comes to terrorists. And so the question was, what would happen to her? Well, as the story goes, Jessica's kidney began to fail. It became obvious that if she didn't have help within the next few days, within the next few weeks, she would die. One of her kidneys had gone bad. And when one of the videos was brought to the notice of the President of the United States at that time, Barack Obama, the question was, what would they do? What would they do? After having a meeting together, at the house, the White House, a plan was developed on how they would send a rescue for Jessica. They planned it to coincide with a time when there would be darkness over that area. They had an idea of the location of where those people would be. And so they sent a special elite SEAL team of about six persons 
in order to go rescue Jessica. Jessica tells the story. One night, all of a sudden, she noticed that there was some movement, some sound. And then, all of a sudden, she heard somebody call her name. Jessica said, there in the desert, in the middle of nowhere, I heard someone call my name. And every time I go through the story, it sends chills down my spine. Because it tells me of a greater love. It tells me of a higher rescue mission. It tells me of a love that is greater than whatever anyone could have for Jessica directed at me. Jessica said, when they called my name, I noticed it was with an accent that was different. And before she knew what was happening, she had been bundled and carried in, by powerful arms and they began to move. She noticed that some of, the, of her captors had been killed. And as they were moving, trying to escape, all of a sudden, they heard a sound. Now what Jessica said next is what gets to me. Sent a lump to my, up my throat. Jessica said, because her, her, those who had come to rescue her felt that there was a threat, an immediate threat to her life, guess what they did? All six of the SEAL team soldiers fell right there on her to protect her from any possible threats. And what she said is, they were ready to die for me. And the interviewer asked us, how did that make you feel? She said she felt special. Jessica was taken back home. The rescue was a success. They got her on the helicopter. One man had carried her up to some distance. Another man carried her until finally they got to the helicopter, special helicopter that had come to rescue them. They left behind eight of their captors killed. And then when they got to the plane, they wanted to help her get up to the uh, helicopter. And she said, by this time, she had gotten her strength back. She says, I can do this. I can get up that as long as this helicopter has come for me, I can do this. She got up into the helicopter that took her back home to safety. Jessica was able to go Get, become reunited to her husband and she said all the while when she was a captive she kept saying it can't end like this this can be the end I don't even have a child I, do, I didn't even say goodbye to my husband I couldn't say goodbye to my father but now Jessica was able to get back be restored to her husband be received by her father she was able to get the opportunity to meet with President Barack Obama Chosen, loved, special, elect. That's who you are. Let nothing change that. That's who you are. By the grace of God, that's who you are. Called by God, loved by God. Died for by heaven. Let nothing change your destiny. Mighty God, I want to thank you for a love greater than we can understand, deeper than we can fathom, more wonderful than we can comprehend, that makes us your chosen. Because when we look at ourselves, dear Father, we see filth, we see inconsistencies, we see failure, we see defeats, but Lord, we thank you because you want to turn us back to the right track. You want to bring us up into heaven. You want to reconcile us unto you. You want to make us part of your family in your kingdom above. And Father, we pray that nothing shall keep this from happening. But as we begin to understand that we are your chosen, 
Help us therefore, dear Lord, to be able to go out to do your mission. To be hands to those who need help, to be fit, to carry forth your gospel of peace, to be your hearts that shall feel the pain, the lostness, the brokenness in our world. They shall be your agents that shall go out on rescue mission for others that shall be your lights in the darkness of this world that shall be the salt to preserve and to give salvo to the people around us that shall be there working in our homes, serving in our communities, ministering in our countries, traveling abroad to proclaim, to announce, to declare the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into light, out of lostness and brokenness into love. Make us yours, we pray. Fill us with your spirits. May we receive the deposit from above to confirm that we belong to you. May we live the lives of victors and overcomers that will show indeed that we belong to you. As we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to praise God for the wonderful time that we've had together. Going through this theme, as for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. And I pray that the decisions, the choices, the commitment that you've made this week, by the grace of God, you shall live by them and you shall lead others to discover this love, this power, this grace, this mercy that you and I are privileged to enjoy. And may your lives never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray.